Loretta Bruning is one of my favorite authors of all time, like my R.L. Stein of my adulthood, except her books are about happiness, not horror. It was about a decade ago I first stumbled upon and got transformed by her work about happiness, neurochemistry, and our inner mammal. She's written about a dozen books, including I Mammal, Tenure Anxiety, and Habits of a Happy Brain, and she's here with us here today. This is episode number 20 with Loretta Bruning. Throughout history and philosophy, we've had a lot of different ideas about what is a state of nature. I think we've forgotten about this. We just assume that nature is the way that we believe it is and that the human brain is the way that society currently tells us it is. But there's been a big, long debate from Rousseau and from Hobbes and through Locke and all these philosophers that we don't even, we think it's oh, it's philosophy. It's just junk we have to learn in school. But these ideas have really influenced how we think we are. And so can you first get into, I think we have to sort of set up the stage before we get into how to be happy and how to live a meaningful, authentic life. We first have to sort of set the stage of what the heck is this place that we're living in? And then what is this brain that kind of controls us, but that we can take control over if we understand it? Well, thank you. You've totally anticipated m- the my new book that I'm writing now. <laughs> so that will be specifically on that topic. So the idea is that we have two brains. We have the brain that we've inherited from earlier mammals, which is widely called the limbic system, and is made up of little bits and parts that people always hear of, like the amygdala and the hippocampus. But what matters is that all put together it's the same as the brain of any other mammal. Now, what makes us different from other mammals is that we have a huge cortex on top of this limbic brain, and the cortex can use language. So when you talk to yourself, you talk in language. So you think that that's the whole story, but in fact, it's really a tiny percent of what's going on. And in fact, whenever you're doing something that an animal could do, you're using your limbic brain. And in fact, your verbal human cortex cannot put your body into action. It has to go through the limbic brain, which is like between the higher cortex and the lower spinal cord. So you're always going through your limbic brain. And yet this modern conception is somehow that you have these flaky emotions that you have to master with your reason. And I think it's very unhelpful view. Right. And it's, it's more it's more than happiness. It's about life, how to live because we're humans. We we don't just want the chemicals. We want uh whether it's an illusion or not, we want to feel like we're living a meaningful, authentic life. And that's what we're we're dealt with. So it's all about expectations, it sounds like. It's about expectations of how how life is going to go and how we're going to feel in the future. And the modern day expectations that prevail are a little bit unrealistic or don't quite match the reality. There's, for example, that nature and the way humans were before these modern times, before capitalism and all of that, we were, it was all peaceful and happy and there's roses and rainbows and all this stuff. And that's how things were supposed to be. And then modern society corrupted that. And as part of that, our state of nature of being these peaceful, loving creatures that sort of Rousseau painted for us and that Locke and all these other guys kind of took over, we think that's our human right and it's normal to feel happy all the time and for these chemicals to always be flowing. And if we don't feel happy, if we don't get our dopamine, we don't get our serotonin, then we think there's something wrong with us, either through the medical model that you talk about, uh, this disease model of, oh, you're, you're schizophrenic, you're bipolar, and maybe that's true, I don't know. Or the companies or the government or these larger societal structures, the system is taking it from us and we're these victims. So I threw a lot out there right there, but this is- You said it perfectly. You've summarized my new book. <laughs> I know. I I kind of just want to like interview you, but like I I've been oh man I've been uh, 
yeah, we have to get rid of the misconceptions and sort of these myths, this current paradigm. We have to change the paradigm. But before we can change the paradigm, we have to look at, okay, what is it? Oh, yes, exactly. We have to understand that our current way of understanding ourselves is just a paradigm. It was created by a certain number of people and taught to you. And you believe it because everyone around you believes it. But it's just false and it's not even helpful. Like they try to make it sound like it serves the greater good and it's compassionate. But it's really, I think it it does more harm than good in the long run. So what is the paradigm? Um, As you said quite correctly, um, I didn't say in the beginning that the feelings of well-being that we have are created by chemicals. And those chemicals are 100% controlled by the limbic brain, the brain we've inherited from earlier mammals. But how does an animal know when to feel good, when to feel bad? It's with neural pathways built from past experience. But what is your experience? Your big human cortex is a big part of the experience. So it's not just what actually happens to me, but what I tell myself about what happens to me. However, the biggest neural pathways that control your happy chemicals and unhappy chemicals are built when you're young, because that's when you have a lot of myelin, which creates the super highways of the brain or called the gray matter. Uh, white matter, sorry. So um, the bottom line is we are all very much shaped by our early experiences. Whatever made you feel good before makes you feel good now. Whatever made you feel bad before makes you feel bad now. But you don't consciously know that because it's just a pathway that channels your electricity to a chemical. And because you don't know the reason, your big human cortex comes up with a sophisticated, intellectualized explanation to make you look good and sound good and be socially acceptable. So so that's a big part of it all. Now, the other part of it, I mean, in addition to what you've all said, is that these happy chemicals are only released in short spurts to motivate you to take action to meet a survival need, and then they turn off. So we're always frustrated because they're not on all the time. And that's part of this modern illusion that your happy chemicals should flow all the time for no reason. And when they don't, you're convinced that you have a disorder and someone can fix it, which is not a very useful way of understanding your own brain. And nowadays we have so many hacks. I know you hate the word hack, at least hacks and tricks and things that can help us feel like we're actually taking action, like we're actually going out and getting those rewards that dopamine would push us towards and that we actually have status, that we have something to be proud of uh, with serotonin or that we have um, safety and a tribe with oxytocin. But these are just feelings. It's not about the happy chemicals, really, I think. It's more about the action, the living your life in a certain way and the way your brain motivates you to take these actions to live this life is to make you feel good. But we forget about the overall project of living a meaningful life and we just want the feel-good pleasure chemicals for fun. And that seems to be a problem. Well, many people are focused on living a meaningful life now. But the way they define meaningful is, of course, very much shaped by the way other people define it because a brain learns from inputs, especially when you're young. So whatever your college professors told you was a meaningful life, whatever is cool, like whatever your peers see as a meaningful life, then you want that, and that stimulates your happy chemicals. So then could have some bad long-run consequences. So then you say, oh, that's not really a meaningful life. I want to change my mind. And that's what's hard because it's hard to build a new neural pathway and it's hard to get your electricity to flow away from the pathways that are built up by so much repetition in your past. And the other thing is that hack, as you mentioned, so one of the popular hacks So I talk about how in the animal world, animals are very status conscious or focused on social dominance. And when you want to live a meaningful life, um, 
one popular way to do that is what I call moral superiority, that I'm focused on higher values. And so I may have failed in X, Y, and Z, but my values are better than your values. And so when I think that, I get a little bit of the good feeling of serotonin. And this is um, a thought loop that leaves people stuck in like having to constantly feel morally superior despite the fact that mm, they may be doing things that they wish they weren't doing. So then they have to keep finding fault with other people in order to keep stimulating their serotonin by feeling morally superior. So that becomes defined as the meaningful life. So it's like we've been thrown into this brain of ours because we weren't really consciously thinking how to live our lives when we were in those uh, myelination years of age like two to eight and then in puberty. We were just scrambling around. Uh, our brains were still being built. And that's the reality that we're still living in. Like you've been saying, you wrote a blog post about a decade ago almost, and this sort of sub chapters appeared in a lot of different books where it's always high school in our brains. And it seems to be a dominating theme that goes through all of your books. And uh, it's, it's not a new idea. It's not just in the new Status Games book, but it's, it's been there the whole time. So um, dig into that a little bit, which you already have. Sure. But yeah. 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 So it's not that something is wrong with you. It's not that something's wrong with society. And it's not that something's wrong with your parents, although it could be, you know. Um, but the bottom line <laughs> is, we're all wired. Times. <laughs> but that's normal. It's normal. If our parents... Yeah, they were in the same boat. I mean, like we often blame our parents and our childhoods, and we all had something wrong with our, our culture or our, our upbringing and all of that. And we think we're special somehow, but no, that's normal. Like, get over it. Uh, take some action, accept it, and move on. Anyway, I uh, interrupted you there. Uh, yeah, keep going. <laughs> yeah. So the idea is that our early pathways can never be perfect predictors of how adult life works. Because when you're young, you're helpless and you need other people to meet your needs. And our brain evolved to reward us with good feelings when we meet our needs. So when you're a kid, part of your job is to learn the skills necessary to meet your needs in the future. But a lot of your experience is how do I get other people to meet my needs for me? Because that's what a newborn baby has to do. So that's this, this balance of like, I have to learn these skills, but I really would rather you, you tie my shoes for me and you cut my meat for me. But then when you're a teenager, then it's like, I know everything better than you. <laughs> so there you are with whatever skills you happen to have myelinated. And they're of course not perfect predictors of adult life. And again, society is often um, blamed for this. And yet we look in this idealistic way of uh, some hunter-gatherer child growing up, watching their parents, you know, gathering food, preserving the food, preparing the food. And by the time their parents die, which is going to be a young age, they need to know those skills in order to survive. But we've created this culture where teenagers are given so much power that they don't do anything to meet their own needs, and yet they're convinced that their parents are wrong on everything and they know better. So I think this, this culture adds a new level of difficulty in building the self-regulation skills that we need. Yeah, but it feels really bad when we don't go down that those big super highways built in our youth and we get a surge of cortisol we feel like we're going to die and we'll, we are going to die and that's another thing we might get into but and we know we're we know that but that feels really bad so we have to sort of distract ourselves find anything to distract ourselves from that pain to tell ourselves either a story or consume kind of some kind of substance or join some kind of group uh feel better somehow and usually we choose the easy path but how how do we get beyond high school? And is it even possible? Like there's a, there's a pain that you feel when you don't go down the big road that you've been going down that everyone else is often going down too. And how do you, what do you do in that moment of pain to get to where you actually need to get? 
Good question. And this is the focus of my work. So let's use the example of a person who smokes cigarettes and wants to stop smoking. That's a fun example because most of us don't smoke cigarettes so we could feel so superior (laughs) before you use a more challenging example of what's more meaningful to you. So, So there's two things. So first is the urge for a cigarette is a big neural pathway that whenever I'm in this situation, oh, I want to have a cigarette. Whenever I'm in that situation, I want to have a cigarette. What happens if you don't have a cigarette? Well, then you have to do some other behavior, but that other behavior is not a well-developed neural pathway. And the electricity in the brain flows like water in a storm into the pathways that are already well-developed. So when you try to do something different, it's sort of like trying to divert a river into a soda straw. We have these billions of extra neurons, but they're not connected, so they don't channel electricity easily. So the simple answer to your question is, if you repeat a new behavior, then the new pathway develops. And if you're already in adulthood, it's not going to develop as easily as it did in childhood, but repetition will develop it. So first you have to choose the new behavior in order to focus on repeating it. So if I want a cigarette and I say to myself, okay, what am I going to do in that moment when I want a cigarette? Let me choose some other behavior and then repeat that. So that's all hard enough. But then one layer to make it a little harder is, what is the alternative way of meeting your needs without the cigarette? First, you have to understand what need is the cigarette really needing. And to do that, you have to go back to the moment when you had your first cigarette. And what is that neural pathway? And for most people, whether it's a cigarette or whatever other bad habit you may be thinking of right now, the first moment when you did it, You were feeling bad for some reason, and that habit that you have now, it made you feel good right away. And your brain said, wow, that works. So whether that thing is a video game or a glass of wine, or, you know, it could be a workout on your bicycle, whatever it is, it built a pathway that says a bad feeling will stop immediately if I do X. So if you don't do X, now you're stuck with the bad feeling that you had before that. And that's really the challenge for all of us is to recognize and dig into our own old cortisol pathways of the bad feelings we had when we were young, and then to redirect them. And on the one hand, you could say it's easy because When you were young, you were powerless, and now you could look at that thing that you're so upset about and say, oh, that's not such a big deal. I could solve that. But none of us think that way because the pathway is so big and the cortisol is happening right now. And cortisol makes you feel like you're going to die because that's its job. And so that's why we all overreact to stupid minutiae. It sounds a little bit like what Stephen Pressfield calls like the resistance, right? So maybe when we feel this pain, this cortisol, usually we run away from it and we cover it up with some kind of substance or stupid thing. And instead, if we face it head on, it might actually be a sort of way pointing us, a sort of spotlight pointing us to where we actually need to go because that's... Um, it's showing you this is a neural pathway that is big and it controls your life, but clearly you don't want to go down this path. So is there an upside to cortisol in this way? Well, most people know that cortisol is the trigger that gets you to do something, anything. And um, there's been a lot of debate about it, but a simple way to think about it is the first impulse in life, like you're hungry, and cortisol is triggered by low blood sugar. So before a baby knows what milk is or what hunger is, low blood sugar triggers cortisol and you feel bad. And in humans, when you feel bad, you cry and crying brings help. And that builds the loop of my cortisol is triggered. I feel 
desperate, I cry, I get help. So that's a circuit in everyone. So we really need to understand that circuit to build an alternative, which is, you know, I, I, my cortisol is triggered, I feel bad. I look for an explanation of what's the problem, and then I trust my own ability to meet that need rather than feeling helpless and powerless as I was wired in the past. Okay, and this wiring is going on whether we consciously or verbally recognize it or not, but how important is it to actually consciously or verbally understand these stories and these pathways? Um, is that Some people say you don't need to know, you don't need to know, it's all in the body, just let the body do its thing, but part of me, part of me feels like I do need to, lay this out with words and figure out what's going on because that's that's my way of moving forward. I definitely agree that we need to lay it out in words, but there's this two extremes. So one is, as people said, oh, it doesn't matter. You could just ignore it. The other extreme is to look at your trauma <laughs> and then you identify with that trauma and that becomes the template through which you see your whole life. So I'm not saying that. Uh, so we've all had bad experiences, and yet a lot of our cortisol is triggered by very small things. So a simple example, if I'm a child and I want to join some other children on the playground and they don't want to play with me, that's not really a trauma. But it feels that way to the mammal brain because an isolated mammal is quickly eaten by predators. And... Because in my mind, I'm associating that with some other thing, like they don't want to play with me because of this, and I'm building it up into a big deal. They will never want to play with me. And usually we inherit these thought loops from our parents. So our mirror neurons learn from, like your parents are traumatized because they're making a big deal over X, Y, and Z. And so you learn to do that. So, but the other side of this is that, all throughout life, I will get rejection. I will apply for jobs that I get rejected from. I will go on dates with people who don't like me. So if I think I need to get my way all the time in order to be happy and to avoid that cortisol pathway, that's not a very effective life management strategy. <laughs> so instead of seeing it as a trauma, we have to say, it's reasonable for a child to feel threatened, and it's reasonable for me to feel threatened today when my cortisol surges, but I can use my full capacity to take a fresh look at that and then decide what's some other view that I would like to have to make this into a happy situation rather than an unhappy situation, okay? So just to use that example, if I get rejected from a job or rejected from a date that I go on. So I could, you know, a lot of people think, oh, they were jerks anyway. I don't want to be with them. And, you know, that people have that loop because that works. Um, but then you can end up thinking everyone is a jerk. And so it's important to be aware of these thought loops. And one that I like to think is that I have a thousand different paths in front of me and when I get this rejection, that blocks this one path. And so there's 999 other paths. So that's just one way of making it into a positive, but you can make up your own. Right. So it sounds like understanding where we come from, how our brain got to be the way it is, that's one step of the process. Uh, but a lot of people stop there and say, that's the end of the story. I'm traumatized. I have this disorder. I'm a victim, and they're just sort of frozen in time, and they're waiting for someone to help them or save them, or or they just enjoy. Maybe trauma is a way to feel good about yourself, sort of gain this status, gain this all these happy chemicals through this through clinging to that past and not moving forward. But the whole point of going back and looking at that supposed trauma is to start taking action steps to to move forward beyond that. But we, we kind of stay in sort of step one of that process. People, if they stay in step one, it's because the current mental health model 
is that an expert can fix you. All you have to do is accept help. So this phrase, accepting help, implies that you don't have to do anything except accept the help. So I think that that disease model is a little bit harmful. And this whole model that I am broken, but I can be fixed would be better replaced by the idea that happiness is a skill. It's hard for everyone. Our happy chemicals are stimulated in short bursts, and we can all learn to stimulate them in new ways, but it takes work. But nobody's telling you that. They're telling you that you have a disorder and all you have to do is accept help and they'll fix the disorder for you. Right, because even in your life, you had it. People might think, oh, Loretta Bruning, she's this happiness expert. She must have be a really happy person. And I guess you are, but you're human. And you had this rough upbringing. Your grandfather was basically living in the middle of the mafia, and he moved to the U.S. to escape. And then uh, you grew up with this mother who was, I guess, I guess now we'd say she's traumatized, but she was just a, a mess, uh, ranting and raving. And just, yeah, you, you can get into that if you want, but... Um, and then you went through high school where you were basically alone and even throughout university. It wasn't really until you were 40 or uh, you said 41, there was that, you had sort of this epiphany and into your 50s where you started to like kind of wake up and think, what the heck am I doing? And you understood what went on in your life and you could have just stopped there and said, okay, well, this is what I am. Poor me. I'm, I'm just going to like huddle up in my bed and just distract myself with something and or just uh, pity myself. But you started learning more and more about the brain, studying animals, and writing all these books, and kind of taking ownership over your life. And that, that's, that's uh, kind of inspiring for a lot of people because you didn't have it easy, but you kind of still found a way out. And in despite, you're still living in, what, Berkeley or the Bay Area, where it's the epicenter of all this madness, um, a lot of good things about living there, but at the same time, you found an escape and you found a way to live your life in the middle of the, uh, I don't know, the madness. Well, so every one of us, you know, we could find that we have a lot of good things going for us and a lot of bad things. We have a lot of strengths and a lot of weaknesses. So if I listed all the good things that happened to me, it would be a long list. And if I listed all the bad things that happened to me, it would be a long list. So it's a matter of, you know, what list I focus on and what skills I got from the bad things that happened. And, you know, I could say that I wish I learned sooner to um, not let these things get to me. And and also um, what you speak of about my past, again, um, you know, it's, it's very common for people to have, to be in the situation I was in. For example, screaming at your kids all the time was, I think, sort of like the normal way to raise kids. I mean, I think it's, if you My could- My mom did it, that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you could survey all the grandparents out there and being beaten, you know, I like, my mother beat me like a little bit in the early years, but- I know a lot of people were beaten worse and I was not beaten in school. So before me, I know that it was much worse. And also that all of my physical needs were met. So a lot of people had that much worse. And, and also, um, um, so my mother was very unhappy and she shared her unhappiness with me, which today I think people realize is very harmful, although some parents still do it. But I think that was the norm in the past. So it's so much better today that people know not to do these things. And young people don't realize how much things have improved. And <laughs> they think they're growing up in a harsh world. So, and, and then again, about my grandfather and the mafia and my father and the mafia. So... When when I learned about this and I started studying it, I mean, imagine the, the people who are still in this situation, that any money you earn, some mafia person could just come to your door and ask for it, and they'll beat up your kids if you don't give it to them. 
So, uh, you know, I'm like, wow, so lucky to not live in that. And that's why I'm so appreciative of the rule of law and so aware of how common this um, might makes right culture was in the past. So we have these uh, supposed bad periods of our life and we think this is bad. It's like that Chinese story of, uh, you know, where the, the guy has a horse and the sun falls off the horse and you don't know if it's good or bad until the, you zoom out until the end of the story. And so in your story, while your mom is screaming and uh, making you feel bad and it was like a hell storm in there sometimes, that led you to escaping into reading and books and learning. And I feel like a lot of people who end up living a, a meaningful life in the end did have this sort of lifelong learning. And that might have started in childhood where books were their escape. And so how big has that been a part of your life? How Tell me about books and lifelong learning. Also, a lot of people... Although we have this long childhood where we're building our brains up until through high school, a lot of people stop there. They get to university. If they're in a good university, they care, they might keep learning. But a lot of people just check out and all their information is uh, mostly made in those myelinated years. And they never really dig into things and, and develop their brain after that. So talk about this importance of uh books? Why are you so grateful for having books in your life and how that sort of basically made you a writer probably in the end and how maybe if people can find some way to uh, have an adult education in their 40s and 50s and 60s, how that might actually save them from this mess? Oh, good question. Okay. First, I should tell people that when you read the original self-published version of my book, that had a personal autobiography that was cut out when I got a commercial publisher of my book. So most people haven't read that thing that you read. So you're reminding me, <laughs> you know, maybe I should <laughs> do something with it so we could talk about that later. <laughs> um, but so most people don't know this story. So just very simply, I'll say that I grew up in a really tiny house, but like we were so lucky to have that house because before us, all my relatives grew up in like tenements with like, you know, many people in one room and many families sharing one bedroom. So, and then, you know, like living in Queens in a small apartment. So having a house was like such a luxury, but like one bathroom for five people and very small rooms, and my parents were gigantic. <laughs> I guess that's relevant. American. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, so what I said in the book is that um, I withdrew into reading, and when my mother was screaming at me, uh, so every child responds to the trauma of their situation in whatever way works for them. So the reason I withdrew into reading was because it's, you know, like other kids did other things, but in my case, those things weren't there for me or they, they felt worse. So I, I don't want to seem like I'm, you know, having a should like other people should respond to trauma by reading. But yeah, yeah so many people do. And it, it's, an effective way to block it out. And I explain in the book that like the walls were really thin. So I had to have really good concentration to read while I was, while I was listening to all this screaming. So I didn't even realize that I had this skill that, that I was good at focusing or concentrating. And in fact, when I graduated in high school at the top of my class, I mean, you know, with, not the top, but near the top. Yeah. It was a shock to me. You know, I had no idea <laughs> because I wasn't in the social group of those people, you know? So um, then I went to university. And as everyone knows, you have certain choice between being popular or studying, I think. And many people 
um, repeat whatever they did in high school. And so in that way, I guess I was sort of just repeating what I did in high school, just like everybody else. And so I think even already, you know, at a young age, I had already learned a lot more than a lot of people. And then I kept learning. So one reason I kept learning was because I never really learned to trust adults. Like I didn't learn to trust that other people knew better than me. So I trusted myself and trusted what I could figure out better. So that was one thing. Another thing is uh, distraction. So one of my big distractors was travel because we have this illusion. Um, again, everybody has their own, like some people are looking for like the right kind of wine or the right party or something. And I was looking for there's some other culture where everybody's happy and I want to go to that country so I could be happy all the time. And so I would look for and read about this place and this place and this place, thinking that I was going to find that place where everybody was happy. So that was yet another driver of my self-education, you could say. And then another one, uh, uh, also in the distraction department. So when I discovered audiobooks, like, wow, I love that because it kept my mind busy, distracted me from repetitive negative thoughts that everybody has. And I, many people, we're all told that socializing is the key to happiness. That's kind of the internet psychology. But that never worked for me. Like when I was young, yeah, me neither. socializing didn't make, yeah. So it, today now when I'm around people, either I hear them complain I hear them catastrophizing. If you say anything good, it sounds like you're showing off. So I'm not really that motivated to be part of all of that. Yeah. Not to mention everybody listening to the news and just repeating whatever is in the news. Yeah. So again, audiobooks were a way to learn about the world without listening to the news and having all that negativity. So all of that was done without really the intention of writing books. And of course, I did want to write books, but I tried and tried and tried when I was young, and I absolutely failed because I think of this um, popularity thing, which is, um, I'm lo what's a nice word for conformity, you know? Uh, uh, Likeability, that's what they use in the, in the modern psychology. So if you conform to the people and the thoughts around you, then that makes you popular and that helps you get a book deal. So if you think for yourself, that doesn't help you get a book deal. <laughs> so I was very much helped by the advent of self-publishing. And I said to myself, I'm just, this is my last chance. I'm not going to live forever. I'm going to write what I think. Yeah. And sometimes we're stuck in a kind of game, a uh, game. It's not just a status game, but we're getting this dopamine. We have our, our hookup, our way to get all these happy chemicals. And it's often tied to a larger culture or social group. And if we're tied too deeply into it and we're dependent on them as a source of our happiness, this outside, these outside volatile, uncontrollable things for our happiness, other people and uh, belonging to this group and all of this, then it's almost like we, we might say they're censoring us and they're uh, blocking us from thinking for ourselves, but we kind of self-censor ourselves in a way and we just uh, go with things. And so I, I don't think it's coincidence that it was in your 40s and 50s when you started writing all this stuff. I don't know when your mom died, but how did your parents' death, having that, that I think, did that give you a bit, of, a bit of freedom to sort of live your own life, and also leaving the university that you're teaching at and retiring, and that gave you a little bit of freedom. And how, how does, in a way, escape sounds like a bad word, but in a way, we have to kind of extricate ourselves away from being too tied into 
the culture. I know this is exactly opposite of what everyone's saying. Everyone's saying you got to be meshed in with the herd and be one with the herd and don't leave the herd. Uh, or, I mean, in a couple hundred years ago, they would hang you or kill you if you tried to question things. And, and now they're, I guess, canceling us or they're not giving you the book deal or you don't get a job or uh, maybe you can't get a girlfriend or boyfriend or something. I don't know, depending on where you live. But you still, there's a pain of leaving the herd uh, I guess you were used to it because you were sort of off on your own as a child and throughout a lot of your life anyway. So it sort of felt good to you to be alone. And I, I'm the same way. I, I come from a big family. There's 10 of us. It's a big Mormon family. Uh, my mom was also screaming. And I had to escape all that noise of all those children. And their rules were controlled by what their parents told them and what their religion and culture told them. So it was this really... Um, I don't know. I, I feel like I was always in a way in a corner reading books. And then I uh, I went off to Berkeley where you are now. And that felt like heaven to me. Like when you went to Cornell and you're like, oh my God, freedom, I, I, quiet, my own space, kind of. I have a roommate, but wow. And I can just, people are learning here. Yeah. I just thought just choosing what I was going to eat for lunch was like so much freedom that I never had. Yeah. Yeah, and and then after university, I went back to Bakersfield, where I'm from, and Bakersfield itself is is this okay place, but and I was there for I ended up like escaping as quickly as possible, staying on friends' couches and just bumming around in the Bay Area for six months until I uh, found an English teaching job in Korea and it shipped off to Korea because I just want to get as far away from that world as possible. And then I've been in Japan for the past uh, eleven, twelve years, and I, I think this some people just escape their entire country or they abandon everything they have to, to get that feeling of some space and solitude and quiet to, to think for themselves and, and live their life and not be controlled by things. And I, part of me was thinking maybe this is unhealthy because everyone tells me you got to be one with the herd. Um, am I just escaping and distracting myself or, or am I just finding a better environment where I, 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 I I'm happier in and you're still in Berkeley, which is a little confusing to me, but, and I'm throwing out a lot of stuff right here and you can just pick up where, whatever pieces you want. Uh, but how did, uh, how did you, you could have escaped and I kind of escaped, uh, but not fully. And how, how did that sort of freedom away from the herd give you ability to think and actually write the books that you're writing? Cause and actually the quality of the books too, because the way you're writing is different from a lot of what other people are writing. It's a lot of fluff. It's 400 pages. that should be 10 pages. And you write some books. They're usually about 200 pages. Um, you are one that was uh, 35 pages and it had the content of a you know 500 page book. So you are able to just sort of say things and say things as they are, from my perspective at least, and without this fear. And I think that fear... Uh, that the herd instills in you when you are part of them. Uh, they're telling you, say this, don't say this, do this, don't do that. And then you didn't have to worry about that. Somehow you you gave yourself that space away from them and that allowed you to to think and write in a completely different way. And I, I, I'm sure you realize that, but it's very obvious. I've, I read I read so much. You know, I think you read a lot. I've... Uh, <sighs> I don't know, read a, almost a book a day or something like that between audiobooks and not and other books, I, you know, thousands, a couple thousand books probably. And yours really stand out in that way. And there are some other ones. There are some other authors, but I'm guessing if you look back in their life and look at how they're living, they're probably not just meshed in, drinking at cocktail parties and working in some university and loving it. <laughs> schmoozing with editors so that they get a contract. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, first I want to say that um, although I agree with everything you said, um, it doesn't help to be like anti-herd either. Like if you end up being resentful of the herd, yeah. then it doesn't do you any good because you can find something wrong with everyone. And so when I was in grad school, Japan was the big thing and everybody was studying Japan and studying Japanese and everything. And it fit into my mental structure of this is the good place. This is the good culture. Yeah. But then the more you learn about it, you're like, whoa, they have problems too. And they have like, you, you know, of course, 
there's huge pressure in Japan to conform to the herd, like in every minute, mm. in every detail, huge conformity pressure. Oh, yeah. Even now, they're, they're still wearing masks now. And even the government tells them, you can take it off, you can take it off. People aren't taking off the masks. Because then you'd appear inconsiderate, just like in Berkeley. <laughs> anyway, that's another story, but go ahead. Yeah. So humans are pretty much the same everywhere. And so if we find fault with everyone, then we'll be totally alone. So when you know when you said about how I left the herd, et cetera, but uh, I had to work at a job for 25 years where I had to put a smile on my face and be respectful of my boss and get along with my students. And um, I, in no job was I ever considered a high performer, <laughs> even like even if I was trying my best because somehow I wasn't a pleaser uh, of whatever the culture was, but I had to be good enough to pay my mortgage and support my family. You know, so that's the first thing. And then another thing is, yes, so if you want to have a core group of people in your life, which allows for more um, relaxation and sense of safety, because like you're not always looking for a support network because you have one that you could rely on, but any support network you have, you can find fault with them because modern psychology is so good at training you to say, well, you shouldn't put up with that treatment and how dare they do that to you. So you really have to work at building a support network that doesn't get on your nerves. And what I always use as cliche is my husband gets on my nerves, but they're my nerves. <laughs> so it's my job to rewire them. Okay. And so the simple way I look at it is any time if I'm with one other person, I have to focus on the overlap between me and that person. If I'm with 10 other people, then I have to focus on the overlap with all 10 of us, which is quite small. So that's why it's maybe not as much fun in some ways to be with 10 people because you're more limited, but on, in other ways, it's more fun because there's 10 of them. So we're always making these trade-offs and that's what it is to be human. That's natural. And that's why I think we're, we don't really benefit from these idealized notions that people give us. So I'll just mention how I write and why, why I live in Berkeley. So first I live two miles from the border of Berkeley in Oakland. So it's 65 degrees year round here. So that was the main reason I stayed. I love it. <laughs> you know, it's, it sounds superficial, but you know, it's a good reason. Right. So, and um, I would move if I were, I don't know if I should say this in public, like if I were directly affected by crime, but I have not been. And I happen to live in a home where, Although it's not expensive, it's on a hill. So when I look out the windows, I can see to the horizon. Yeah. And I think psychologically that's very valuable. You know, I could live in a house, if I lived in a house that cost 10 times more, but I could not see into the horizon when, it, you know, it's like when you're looking yeah. at a wall. So, so that's, so I'm, and my yeah. husband's not excited to move. And where am I going to move? After all that effort, I'm going to find that people are mammals wherever I go. Right? So um, whatever. So you got to just take, just take ownership of your life regardless. And that seems to be a kind of, kind of common thread through your writing and through your ideas too. It's just take responsibility, get over this victim mentality, and take action. Um, and choose it's like James Altucher says, you know, choose yourself or there's a lot of ideas like that <laughs> and decide for yourself what kind of life do you want to live, okay, and start taking actual actions towards there instead of just thinking, uh, creating stories in your mind or complaining or whatever. Mm. And so, and, and that's sort of the conclusion of your book Status Games too in the end is like, okay, you can keep playing these random games, finding ways uh, to feel happy that maybe you didn't choose and you don't really want to be part of, but it's comfortable and you it kind of 
gets you by, but you're not exactly, you're in sort of this weird middle ground. You're not really unhappy. You're not happy. You're just like, eh, whatever. Maybe, maybe later. Maybe when I retire, I don't know. You don't really think about it, but you're, you're saying, okay, I can, I take actual action steps because even dopamine itself is tied to movement. It's tied to going out into the world. And yeah, can you talk about that? Sure. So action steps, um, it sounds obvious. So why wouldn't people take them? And the reason people don't take them is because we're taught to think big and people have such big goals that then it's too big. So um, then if they have such a huge goal and they failed in the past that they don't want to start, they don't want to try, and your brain does not give you dopamine if it does not see that you're getting closer to the goal. So here's a few examples. The simple one is a young child wanting to be a rock star. And then at some point, they see that they're not becoming a rock star. And they can blame whoever, but the bottom line is that it's a disappointment of a dream. They don't have another dream. So they don't have dopamine. They don't see a way to do it. So what we need is a little bit of a more realistic dream, like exciting enough to get you going, but not so big that it's impossible to get there. Then you need to divide it into small steps. And then you need to give yourself short run rewards for the small steps and not give yourself the rewards if you don't take the steps. Yeah, okay, that's that's something I, I can't believe I didn't talk about this yet. This is one of the big things I want to talk about. Um, I was doing master class for a little while and there was this one on dog training and I loved it. And this guy was teaching you how to train dogs and like, oh my God. And you, I know you've studied a lot about animal training with dolphins and dogs and all these things. How can we use the concepts of animal training to sort of retrain our own brains or our children or um, mostly ourselves really though? Okay, so the way animals learn is a small reward for a small step. Now, when I, sh when I say the way animals learn, that's when humans are training animals. In nature, animals learn from natural rewards. For example, if I find a nut, I eat it and relieves my hunger. If I don't find a nut, then I'm still hungry, so I'm motivated to keep looking for a nut. Nobody gives you nuts in nature. Nobody cracks the nuts open for you. But when you do find a nut, then the good feeling of relieving your hunger stimulates your dopamine, and that connects all the neurons active at that moment, and that wires the animal to find nuts in the same way in the future. So anything that works, that feels good, it wires you to repeat that. So what animal trainers have discovered, uh, and it's fascinating to watch them and read about them, is if you reward an animal for taking a small step, and then the animal wants to repeat that behavior. And when you keep rewarding that behavior, that builds a pathway, and then the animal will repeat it easily. Now, how do you get the animal to take the first step? Because you can't say, well, do a triple flip, and then I'll give you a steak. So all you do is you give them a tiny, tiny bit of steak when they turn their head to the right, and they'll keep doing turning their head to the right, and then soon they'll be doing a triple spin. Yeah. So it's just breaking it down into very small steps. Just a tiny step, tiny step. Yeah. So I first learned this from the dog whisperer, who is hated and despised here in Berkeley. Um, but um, I learned, uh, I, I had an opportunity to go to a dolphin training facility in Mexico. So anyone who's into this, anyone, any most tourism regions in Mexico have a dolphinarium and they sell this um, behind the scenes experience with the dolphin and you get to, to give them the fish, you give them the hand signal, they do the behavior, you give them the fish and then you could even over time create your own behavior and your own hand signal. It's so fun. Yeah. And you also, I, I'm trying to avoid all the normal, you've, you've been on like a Billion podcasts. If people want to hear more of your ideas, they can just go on Spotify or wherever and type in your name, and they'll like be 
probably a thousand interviews. I don't know. It's crazy. A lot of interviews. Thank you. So let's, yeah. So if you can ask me something else, that would be fabulous. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm not, I'm not going to so tell me what's dopamine, what's serotonin. Like I've heard yeah, it yeah, again I know, and again. And you're like, let me talk about this stuff. Yeah. So, you know, what I haven't talked about yet is my writing style. So let's talk about that. And first, I want to emphasize that I'm not... You look, at my, look at my flashcard. My flashcard is next one. Good writing. Oh, thank That's you. That's my next flashcard. Okay. okay. So um, a few things. So first, I totally sympathize with how horribly boring academic writing is. It's just infuriating and maddening. And uh, I, having spent my life in, inside the sausage factory... You know, I know why academics write that way because they're just spending their whole lives criticizing each other. So they never want to come out and say anything because anything you say will get criticized. So they're mostly avoiding saying things. It's very frustrating. Then there's the crossover books where a person with an academic track record will try to write a book for the public, but also is anticipating the way it will be attacked by their peers. So when I first took my early retirement, uh, that's where I was. I was anticipating being attacked. And I had also never had a successful track record of academic writing because all of this data, I felt that it was all cherry picking, that they were constructing statistics to prove this or this. And it seemed like to me that these conclusions didn't pass the smell test to me. And they yeah. were just cherry picking statistics to prove whatever was the politically correct theory to prove. So I decided I was not going to write to please my peers because I had already failed at my academic career. So I'm not like one of those professors who was trying to extend beyond their academic career. I failed, I gave up, I walked away. When I say I failed, I got an honorable discharge. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Which is that I I got emeritus I got emeritus status, you know, so so I'm I'm formally retired with a pension. It's a tiny pension because I retired at age fifty. But it's still. But you don't have an easy. You don't have an expensive lifestyle. You're, exactly. you're like me. You're just okay. I just want to. Yeah. I want my time. I want my space. Yeah. And that's good enough. Yeah. So, um, so how did I decide to write? First, the challenge of noticing my fear of criticism, and then saying, I decided not to do, not to write in a defensive way, like. Um, defending myself from presumed academic attacks, because then it's unreadable. What you write is unreadable. So that's the first thing. But then the second thing, I'm not going to live forever. So this is my chance to say what I think. Yeah. So then I say it. And then I think, oh, that's not going to make sense to anybody, because the way I said it, it came out too long winded. Yeah. So I say, I write the whole book, then I go back to the beginning and I start reading it and the first sentence doesn't make sense to me, the second sentence. So I think if I have to read a sentence twice to understand it, then nobody else is going to understand it either. So I rewrite it. So then I end up really rewriting the whole thing a few times so that finally when I go back to it, it's the sentence is direct. So that the whole point of it is that the sentence is direct rather than full of a lot of qualifiers. And the irony is then I give it to my husband to look for, um, just to have a first reader, and he just wants to add in a lot of qualifiers. <laughs> like, you know what a qualifier is? You know, people often say this rather than people say this, or people may say this, or people tend to say this. Yeah. So you could add a qualifier to, like, you could add ten qualifiers to every sentence. Right. And then you have, then it's unreadable. <laughs> yeah, I studied, I studied philosophy, and uh, I studied philosophy in university, and I was just like one of those. Don't do it. You just try to cut down the words as possible. And you, if you start studying how to write, it's it's the way you're doing it. Um, I'm sorry if I interrupted you there there a little bit. But I had this idea of when I read your books, and I think a lot of the readers, like, oh, you read a lot of books uh, or watch a lot of movies 
or anything. And it's like this irritating, painful experience. You're just pushed with cortisol because your expectation was, oh, I'm going to learn this or that. Uh, it's it's uh, 400 pages. I'm, I'm expecting to get this out of it. It's a two-hour movie. I'm expecting to get the, And you, you don't really get anything out of it. It just... Um, it doesn't give you the dopamine. It doesn't give you the reward. It doesn't make you feel good about yourself because they're just bragging about themselves and putting you down in a way sometimes. Um, you don't feel belonging. You don't feel connection with the author because uh, they're not revealing any, I don't know, they're not, they're not building that trust with you. And so you just leave like 90% of content, uh, things that are created, these um, products and services, but I'm not going to blame the company. I just always find a different product or service. Uh, these books... God, so much trash out there and so many t- terrible movies. Um, I, be- I think because they're not actually triggering these happy chemicals. And I don't know if the creator, the writer like you, like you, I think when I read your books, it's the opposite. It's um, there are these books where you just, you just zoom through them. You know, people love reading the Harry Potter or uh, Goosebumps or some books that just kind of keep you going, keep you going. You're like, whoa. And it's like this constant dopamine trail. It's like little, little rewards at the end of each sentence almost, and then at the end of each chapter, and it just keeps you going. So there's that dopamine trail. There's that serotonin of making you feel like, oh, I can do this. I know something. And there's like, it's a lot of different angles where you're getting all these chemicals, but and I, I don't need to get into all of that. But when I read your books, I feel happy. I don't feel this pain. I don't feel like I'm getting sh- screwed, like the author's abusing me or something, where I feel like a lot of times I feel like this, this abuse from the author, the movie creator. I'm like, God, what am I? It's some... Don't do this to me. I, I know exactly what you mean. I know exactly what you mean because, well, readers are always telling me, have you read this book? Have you read that book? And they think that I should be reading whatever is like the popular new book on Amazon. But as soon as I look at them, I get exactly the feeling you're talking about. It It feels like the author is disrespecting me somehow because... <laughs> Yeah, they're not saying anything directly. Did you like consciously use your... Well, I think part of it is about the political correctness. Yeah. Um, if we if you talk about political correctness, that there's what is politically correct to say. And it's so narrow that every book sounds the same. Every movie sounds the same. Because mm. if you go out of bounds, yeah. then they cancel you. So everyone says the same thing to protect themselves from getting canceled. Right. And whenever we're getting the same information again and again, this is also this uh, habituation where we're not really getting anything, any new experience, any new reward. And so we don't really feel anything. We're just like, okay, I know this already. I know this already. But you're, um, it's not like you've created this reality, but you're tapping into this part of reality that the mainstream media and uh, academia and everything is not, it's not showing us. And you're showing us this and that makes us feel, wow there's something new here and we're going down this path of information and knowledge that makes us feel really good. What we don't, what we normally expect to get like a, we're opening up this box and it's empty or it has like one tiny little cracker in there. I'm like, what, what is this? It's all air. I've, I've, I've been here before. Show me something new. Where can I get new stuff? And your action, you're packing it in. You're just packing it in, making up for all the lost times and all those books that we just wasted. You know, I'm not trying to, um, thank you, thank you. Know, you bow bow down to the to the, to the big monkey right here, but still, uh, it's it's true. And I think you've heard this from a lot of your your readers. So um, I don't know what you're supposed to say to that. Well, but. so let's add to add one thing. Um, people have struggled to understand their inner mammal from the beginning of time, yeah. and your philosophy major. That's mostly of like the history of how people have always studied to understand their inner mammal. Although like, when I read that philosophy, I, it didn't help me understand my inner mammal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but people no. want to understand it. And so that's when I read the first monkey study and the second monkey study. And I was like, oh my God, this is it. This explains everything. Why didn't anybody tell me this? So I think it's it's what we're all looking for is to understand these responses that our nonverbal brain produces. I'm going to get into a couple other topics that aren't really important to everybody, but they're important to me. Like we already talked about writing and and some of those other things that some people think, I don't care. Why are you talking about that? But I care. So this is my chance to talk to you. Uh, Comedy. I also love comedy and I know you love comedy. So why is comedy important 
to you and why why I feel like comedy sort of snaps us out of that social reality and brings us back to something that we're missing and that like almost like a tickle or a laugh or a cry it it wakes us up and we feel this authenticity or we're like we're alive or something that's what I think and I feel really happy and we all love to laugh and it's not just the endorphin from laughing it's something beyond that it's this aliveness or this authenticity or this truth and yeah what role does comedy play in your happiness and uh our happiness it's not beyond that why is comedy important and how does it work well yeah so a simple answer of how it works of theories that like anyone who hasn't read my book i explain about endorphin uh, from laughing but as you say it's more so one theory is that it's relief of threat. So the simplistic example is the person slips on a banana peel and then they're okay. So it's like threat and then relief. But the usual comedy is some social taboo has been violated. And then it it's like, if you violated that social taboo, you'd be scared. But when someone else violates it, it's have like this sigh of relief of like, ah, oh, we can violate that social taboo. So I think that's part of it. Yeah. Now, um, it's very individual. So that's what I emphasize. And so I'm glad you didn't ask me for comedy recommendations <laughs> because it's very individual. And um, I don't like the comedy that someone else likes and someone else doesn't like what I like. And in addition, I have to really work a bit to, to find stuff I like and then after all these years, like I've used up so much of the stuff I like. And I think, oh, if I could only go back and watch <laughs> such and such for the first time, you know. Yeah. Um, so so it's a challenge to find that. And so what I always say is I have it queued up so that when I'm feeling bad, that it's ready and that it's a distractor. And I think it's a fabulous distractor. And what everyone needs is healthy distractors. So it doesn't have to be comedy, but it has to be a healthy distractor. Yeah. So for example, you know, if a person thinks uh, alcohol is a good distractor, but if they then indulge too much, if pizza is a good distractor, but then if they indulge too much. So we need other distractors in our toolkit so that we don't overuse the ones that we have. And a simple example is like video games that some people find as a distractor. But then if you do it too much, you get, you know, tense. Yeah. So we all need to experiment with new distractors. So one, um, gambling is very sad because when a person is gambling, they're having the positive expectations from their first win. And then they're not thinking about all the other things that they're worried about. And then they just make their life worse. So distraction is, uh, I say distraction is popular because it works. And it takes a bit of effort to find healthy distractors and have them always ready so that you don't go into some unhealthy distractor. There are a lot of, uh, I would say, unhealthy distractors, which for some reason people might actually enjoy based on their upbringing or whatever. Uh, I know you're really averse to, you're very turned off and scared away from uh, these high stimulation things, roller coasters, uh, these adrenaline based things, horror movies, the news, crime, true crime and all that. Right. But if another person likes that. So is that okay? If some people actually enjoy that and in the long run, it doesn't, it, I, I can't imagine how it wouldn't negatively affect you in the long run, but. Exactly. You have to be honest with yourself about whether it's negatively affecting you. For example, this, the main example is if you do it before bed and then can't fall asleep. Another example is if you watch some horror movie and then you're w walking home alone from work at night and having anxiety and you don't think it's caused by that horror movie you watched, but, but it may be. So we have to be really honest about these things. Yeah. And I want to uh, be respectful of your time, but I'm having so much fun talking to you. And uh, but I know you probably had a plan. Okay, what are we doing? How long are we talking? No, so, no, oh. it's fine. It's fine. I, I like I said, I'm so happy to answer any question other than tell me yeah. how dopamine works. Tell me how serotonin works. 
Yeah, what foods can I eat to increase my dopamine? <laughs> Google it. Go to ChatGPT, and it doesn't even know. So whatever, man. <laughs> yeah, which is which is important. But um, you did kind of get into this topic of we, there is sort of this natural, these natural cycles. I think, uh, of course, we can kind of get our dopamine whenever we want by taking these actions, and we can get serotonin by doing things that we're proud of that that we want to do, and and we can get oxytocin by having people that we trust and feeling safe but are there times of the day uh certain times of the day or zooming out times of the year or times of your overall life like decades or whatever where it might be more optimal of course it's going to be very individual but are there general trends that humans or mammals share where there's this time of the day where maybe you should seek the dopamine, and this time maybe uh, you shouldn't get too action based. You should start to cool down. Uh, we've seen these charts of okay, your cortisol is supposed to spike in the morning and go down at night, and then the melatonin comes up, and there's all this stuff that you've seen. How much do you believe in all this, and what's your ideas about this timing of the neurochemicals? Sure. So, um, I think it's somewhat more individual than what you're suggesting. Yeah. But here's a simple fact. We all have a limited amount of energy. And by the end of the day, your energy is drained. And there's something, it's Ray Baumeister calls it ego depletion. When you have less energy, you're more easily going to slide into those negative thoughts or that bad habit. Uh, So it takes a certain, what's called ego strength, that's the positive use of the word ego, takes ego strength to say, I'm not a person who eats candy bars all day. (laughs) So you could do that all day, but then like 10 minutes before bed, you might eat five candy bars because you've run out of energy. So the bottom line is you shouldn't be trying to do very challenging things late in the day because you have less energy. That's inevitable. And yet so many people do it. And when I say challenging, I mean both challenging work-wise and challenging in terms of having like uncomfortable conversations. Uh, So it's better to do hard things when you have limited energy. And then sometimes you just have to Divide up your hard things into slices and say, I'm going to do another hard thing tomorrow morning and another the next morning, rather than try to do every hard thing today. Now, apart from that, um, when when a person has um, a boost or a dip in terms of like time of year, time of day, I think everyone has to plan for themselves. And a lot of people are influenced by others. So there's become this cliche that by the third week of January, everyone's depressed. So if you read all those articles, then you're going to give yourself permission. Oh, it's not my fault. Everyone's depressed now, blah, blah, blah. Then Valentine's Day say, oh yeah, everybody's depressed because nobody's relationship is like the movie. So, you know, and then you could say, oh, and then, you know, this time everybody's a president, you know, so, so you have to, um, manage your own. Like when you think I am easily feeling good and easily not feeling good. For example, you hear cliches about like spring or summer that everyone's happy. Um, but you know, many people are not self-directed. So once they leave structure, then they may end up more unhappy because they're not making the choices that give. So, so everyone can monitor their own patterns and then decide. So, um, like I, I always say, you know, I, I do my hard tasks first thing in the morning. And then if something fun comes along, I go out of my way to save it for later in the day Um, And if something really fun, you know, I save it for when I have some really bad activity. I have to tell you a funny (laughs) example. Um, It sounds horrible, but um, so I have a a relative who's dying of cancer. Let's just get right to the point. So being in a room with a person who's dying of cancer is, you know, is draining. Yeah. 
And so I planned like, okay, what's a fun thing to do in that neighborhood? And, um, and I did something fun before the visit and after the visit in that neighborhood. And I'll tell you, it involved food. <laughs> so, and it doesn't mean I overate, you know, it's just, that was a good day to treat myself to some something that I'd been wanting to try. And this is a this is a side <laughs> point, but that's another beauty of being where you're living. The great food. <laughs> oh, great food. Yes. Uh, not just the view you got from your house, but amazing food, man. Although I have to tell you, so here's another another thing about um if we talk about like a cortisol spiral. So I went back to a restaurant that I'd been with with family. Now you know when you go someplace with a group of people and you're more focused on what can we order? This is Chinese food. Like, what could we order that everyone could agree on, whatever? So I wanted to go back there so I could just pick whatever I wanted. Yeah. And so I was like, for the past year, I was like, oh, I want to go back to that place so I could pick whatever I wanted. So this was like a dopamine thing that gave me something to look forward to. But I have to tell you that when I picked it, it was not that good. I made some bad choices and yeah. didn't really especially like what I picked. So some people go into that poor me spiral. Um, uh, that was that was I think in the book the part of the book that was cut out. That when I went to a restaurant with my mother, she would always not like what she got, and always end up looking at other people's food and feeling like I'm not getting the good stuff. And it was such a deep pattern in her. And then after she died, I learned that she literally didn't have enough enough food to eat yeah. and went hungry a lot. So imagine living in a world and you're seeing everybody else eating and you're not having any. So I saw how that was like a real pathway in her brain that she just flowed into all the time. But other people can look at themselves and say, how how did I create that poor me spiral in my past and how am I flowing into it? Another good thing about when you say you have, you put your hard tasks first in the early in the day and then you do the kind of more fun or easy things, uh, pleasurable things later on is one, it's like energy thing. You have more energy to do it in the morning and more uh, willpower or whatever you want to call it. But then it also goes back to your whole um, animal training type thing where you kind of do the work and then you reward yourself afterwards instead of uh, waking up in the morning and picking up your phone and rewarding yourself for what? Uh, for waking up? And then your energy's gone. Yes. And it sort of it leads you down this weird trail. And then it's noon. You start eating lunch. And then you're tired. And the whole day's gone. Uh, so it's an energy thing. But it's also this this reinforcement thing, uh, a sort of... We're more than an animal, but we are animals. So it's this animal training, this this training of rewards of not not reinforcing these negative behaviors. But you got to do the work and then reward yourself. So I don't know if that's what you were thinking, but yeah, yeah. So yeah, you do um, have to be very careful about what you reward yourself for and not give up all the rewards too soon. But in my work, I'm always careful not to make the assumption. So some people are. Um, let's say under under expecting from themselves and some people are over expecting from themselves so like you said one person may wake up in the morning and just yak with their friends and not get in gear but another person may do the opposite where they're suddenly worried about 10 people are mad at them for not having finished a project already and they're creating that too, that sense that everybody's mad at me. I can never take a break because everybody's mad at me and everybody wants too much from me. That's a thought loop that then leads them to a, a bottle of scotch at night, but they may not be underperforming during the day. So it's quite individual, but we have to be very careful about how we use our rewards. And to be honest, I, I do... Um, use my food rewards while I'm working <laughs> because, um, yeah, I do. Yeah. I know it's, it's considered a big taboo. Um, it works. It works for you. Yeah. And then when I'm done working, then I'm moving around and yeah. So, yeah. And we don't need to be perfect. We're not going to be perfect. Like people might assume, Oh, uh, you wrote these books about this. You must be a machine. Uh, you've got it all 
checked in and you never make a mistake. You're, or, or you're always happy because you wrote these books on this, but that's not true. I mean, you do think sometimes. And that's another thing is when we, and we're going to, we call it slipping up or that we're making a mistake or we are breaking our ethical code or something and we feel guilty from this. But I guess that's just part of being a mammal, a big brain mammal, right? We're just, we're going to mess up and it's not messing up. It's just what we are. We're not perfect. We're not always going to be happy and we're not always going to be doing what we want to do. But also there are these sort of simplistic rules for happiness that have become popular. So some people it's diet. And so then their diet has to be this and this and this, and they think they'll be happy if their diet is perfect. And then they spend their whole life like being miserable about over analyzing their diet and still doesn't make them happy. Yeah. For other people, you know, it's exercise. And if I could only run this many miles or do this many push ups, I'll be happy. And then if you're not happy, then you have to run even more miles. So then there's so many other versions of that. So, um, I guess the idea is more to say what what feels good to me now. Yeah. And again, with the um, the social thing is pleasing. You know, a lot of people talk about people pleasing. Like, I will be happy if my kids are happy, or I will be happy if my spouse is happy. So then you're putting, you're giving them veto power that they can find fault with you. And now you have to be unhappy. So that's not yeah. very useful. So I had to work very hard not to put my happiness reins in somebody else's hands. And I think you're kind of alluding to this earlier, but there's this sort of generational thing going on in America, at least, where these parents sacrifice themselves for their children. And then at the same time, they blame their children for their own unhappiness. And it doesn't really matter. But there's no easy answers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, another thing is about work. How do we find meaningful work these days? I know you you didn't really find it. There are some people who are maybe they're hyper social, so they, they can they can enjoy work just from the social aspect of it. But if you don't, or if you do, either way, how do we find work that actually? Because um, that's a big part of our life, and. Uh, how do we find work or create work that actually matters to us and makes us feel more than happy, but it makes us feel authentic or alive? So I think expecting too much from your job, like expecting the job to make you happy, it's sort of like expecting your spouse to make you happy. Like every spouse will fail and every job will fail if you put that burden on it. You know, and if you expect your kids to make you happy, then you're just going to make them miserable. So you can't put that excessive burden. First, you have to accept that our inner mammal releases happy chemicals in short spurts. You won't have it all the time. And it releases them for kooky reasons. And the other thing you mentioned, this thing about um, that we know we're going to die. And this is this sense of doom hanging over us. And so we're thinking, I have to do something fabulous in order to make my life worthwhile. And yeah. people look for an altruistic way of saying that, that I have to be of service to others to make my life worthwhile. But really, they don't want to acknowledge the selfish thing. I want to be remembered because creating something that survives eases my fear of death. Yeah, That's what we really want. And we can't, we can't go forward until we admit that to ourselves. So then your job can't put you on the map and make you a superstar every minute of every day. And when you read the personal life stories of people that you think are some superstar, they really have to do a lot of selling out or sacrificing. So we really need realistic expectations. But it's hard to do that because the current educational philosophy is to tell kids that they're going to be a star if they study. So so that's a problem. So how to find work that you like. So first, have realistic expectations, have some something that you feel can build a legacy outside of work. 
so that you're not putting too much burden on the work. So in the work, you can learn some skills that will help you promote your legacy, but you can't put it all on that. And certainly you can't hinge your whole life on approval, the approval of your coworkers, just like the approval of your spouse. It feels good when you get it, but if you need it every minute, it's going to make you miserable. I've just now identified another sort of common theme is this idea of almost diversification. We've, uh, just like in the financial world, it seems a bit silly to put all your money in one stock. A lot of people these days are putting all their money in Bitcoin or their one top pick. And then there's this volatility involved in that. However much you expect this stock to go up or this relationship to go up, it's one relationship. That's pretty risky business. If you're putting all your happiness into this one thing, it's going to go up and down and up and down. And you're going to have to live with that. But we've been told that this is a solution. The solution is exercise. The solution is a keto diet. The solution is uh, you got to fall in love and get married or you got to uh, obey this religion or there's different ways to be happy. But it's like they give us, um, I mean, we always want a sort of a simplistic, this this one thing we got to do. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And exactly. This, is, this is the thing. And philosophers are doing the same thing. This is knowledge. This is reality. This is, it's all, you know, Nietzsche, it's the will to power or Freud, it's all about sex. And okay, well, that's how your brain's wired to think about things, but let's zoom out. And that's risky. It's risky. Uh, it's a game you can play, but it's going to lead to a lot a tumultuous, uh, volatile life. So what you're saying about relationships and all these healthy things we do, work, all these things that we think are supposed to make us happy. And we almost zone in on one of them or two of them. And we say, okay, ha, I've got these two stocks. I've got my, my husband and I've got my job and I'm supposed to be happy. It's going to work. And I mean, if you look at the financial world, the stocks and stuff, you think, well, that's obviously not, I mean, you better somehow have a lot of insider knowledge that that's going to work. But even then, uh, so you, how much should we diversify our happiness or diversify our sources of I mean, it's really internal in a way, because like you're saying, you're you're creating it. We're, we're always playing these multiplayer games of, OK, um, competing against these people and competition is part of life. But you don't have to compete in that way. You can create your own games, these sort of one player games. And and you're you're beating level one, level two, level three. And it's this one player game that you're going down and you're enjoying. And yeah, you're still hooked into society. You're not this guy in a cave. You're not a hermit. but your main, I mean, if we go back to the stock world, your sort of main investment is this sort of game you're playing with yourself. And yeah, you might still exercise and eat food and have your relationship, but these are, yeah, they're part of your portfolio of happiness, but they're not like more than 5% or something. So talk about diversification of things we do in life and things that we expect to make us happy. Yeah. So, um, a lot of different things there. So first, um, when I I, people, that's how I talk, I, I talk like I, I bring out like a billion questions at once yeah. and I probably just confuse a lot of people, Yeah, but you can just pick and choose whatever you want from that. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> so, um, this idea of having this, when people have this one thing that they're going to focus on and a lot of people do it because that's the advice you often get. And a great example of that is if you're doing a podcast, like how many downloads did you get on that podcast? And then people obsess over like the numbers yeah. and anything you do, you're really pressured to focus on the numbers. So again, the bottom line is simple, focus on something you have control over. So if you f obsess with the numbers, but you don't really have that much control over the numbers. So you have control over the inputs. So focus on things that you can control and then say, well, I'm going to work on the podcast for this many minutes. And then afterwards, I've done everything that I can control. And then I'm going to go focus on something else because I don't want to obsess over things that like having all of my rewards in one basket. Now, having said that, when we talk about relationships, I always have to add the little footnote that... I'm not saying that you should have affairs because <laughs> um, it may sound, right. it may, the way it came out, you know, it may sound like I'm saying that. So uh, what I mean is 
the, the classic example is when you don't have a relationship, then that becomes a, a goal and a reward. And you think, oh, I'll be happy if I have a relationship with this one, one person. But then once you have the relationship, then that goal is already met. So they are no longer triggering your dopamine. And then it's very common that the person is disappointed with them. They are not triggering my dopamine and I'm in a dip and blaming that person. So it's very important to just say, I need a project, you know, finding, building a relationship with them was a project and now I've done that. And now I need another project that is not related to romance and you keep that relationship alive, but then you have some other project. And, um, some people think you should do the project together, but I have to say that my husband wanted to have his own project. So I can't force him. So I don't think you should force your partner to say, well, you got to do a project with me. I think if they want to fine, but if you have some project to do yourself, that that's very valuable. Same, you know, with your kids, like very often mothers, like they don't have a minute to themselves. And then finally, when their kids grow up, they don't have a project. And then they're sort of resentful that their kids don't need them anymore. So, and it's the same with alcohol recovery. A person works very hard at recovery. And then when they do it, then they have this blank space because they're not working at recovery anymore. So we need a series of projects in our lives. And it's normal for one project to stop exciting you once you've pretty well done it. And then maybe, like I say in the book, is like if you've discovered a new planet, then, or, you know, classic example, person who wins the Olympics. And then when it's over, they feel this vacuum. So all they could think of is to try to win the Olympics again. But now they're four years older and they're going to burn out their body. So sometimes it's hard to put another project on your agenda because it's not the one that you've been wired to care about a long time ago. And so it takes a, a little time and effort to get excited about a new project. And that's, of course, a lot of people ask me about grief when they lose a loved one. And you know, putting a new project on your agenda, it takes time. Maybe you feel guilty, but mostly it's fear of failure, I think, that stops people from putting a new project on their agenda. So again, it's like we have to be conscious of our fear of failure so that we can divide the project into small steps and reward ourselves for small steps. Right. So instead of playing these new games, these new, living these new kinds of lives, or going down these new projects that we're not used to, and that we're, it's going to involve a little bit of failure or um, things along the way. We kind of just stick to what we've known, and that's scary. And there's like a lot of easy ways to. It might go back to also why why so many people stick to this like politically correct um, world, or they stay in their hometown their whole life, or whatever, because that works and it's easy. And they're not going to fail. It's almost like it, the game is so small, but it creates a sort of illusion in our mind that we're doing something that um, we don't really feel this push, the need to go out and do something. And I think if we if we step back and pause for a little bit, we might realize, oh, this is I'm not really doing anything. It's like I don't know if you um, learned about that thing from Robert Nozick. This uh, what was it? This uh, kind of pleasure machine or something like that, a pleasure, a sensation machine, uh, experience machine. Yeah, this experience machine. So Robert Nozick is a philosopher where imagine you put, hook someone up to this basically virtual reality, a simulation type thing where it knows exactly what's going to make them happy and what's going to make them feel good. And it gives them this illusion, this kind of VR experience. Is this a novel? No, it's a philosopher. Okay. So Robert Nozick's a philosopher. He's an, in the, the past hundred years or something. He was, he's um, kind of a modern philosopher. And Basically, and there probably are novels on this, but this is thought experiment that a lot of philosophers do. And imagine you hook someone up to this simulation machine that feeds them all these happy chemicals and makes them feel and gives them the experience of love and riches and all these things that they wanted. And then you tell the participants in this supposed experiment, um, this is what's going on. And say, okay, you can choose. Do you want it? It's kind of like the Matrix, basically. Um, and you can choose, do you want to 
live this fake, uh, pleasurable life? It's more than pleasure, this happy life, this perfect life. Or do you want to be in reality? Uh, where I guess you have to take action and do things like that. And oh, that what is the most matrix. People- Maybe the matrix is yeah. Is the matrix based on that book? It sounds like it. It might be. I mean, the matrix goes back to Plato and everything, right? I mean, it's uh, this is it's, it's this idea of like, do we stay in this sort of uh, this illusion, this sort of simulated reality uh, where we're basically just sitting in a chair doing nothing, but we feel like we're doing something, or do we kind of wake up and go out into the world? It's also like I think what's going on when we're sleeping too. Um, that's a whole nother question, but I feel like when we're we love sleeping, and we'll put a pin in that nozick, that thought experiment thing. But I think a, a sort of another way to explain it is through sleeping and dreaming. I, I have this idea that when we dream and when we sleep, particularly dreaming, we're I think we're lacking. This is completely non scientific. It's just my thing. But we we lack certain neurochemicals or things in our life, and we through our dreams we kind of create this illusion that we actually have these things. So like I'm living in Japan, I often. Uh, dream about spending time with my brothers and my family and all that, or that I have this thing that I don't have, and and then you don't want to wake up from this dream. You 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 push a snooze on the alarm and you go back to sleep. You want to go back to sleep where you're you're basically sitting still and you're not doing anything. You're in this basically simulated reality that sleep gives you, and you want to stay there because it's easy and you don't got to do anything and it feels good in a way. Because uh, sometimes these dreams are scary, but well, I guess that's part of the ride too. But it's this sort of simulation and uh we kind of want to keep and i I think especially when we don't have a sort of meaningful uh project in life when we don't have these chemicals going on in our waking life just as we might hide away in these small little bubbles in society like there's some i mean it's fine to have a religion it's fine to be part of the uh, this political movement or whatever if actually in the long run it does make you happy and does does uh, make you live a good life, but we kind of hide away in these frozen states where we're not actually doing anything. We're just talking and blabbing and kind of doing nothing with our actual lives, or we're doing actions, but they're not our authentic actions. And I don't know what authentic- authenticity really means, but it's like I kind of chose this for myself. It's my game I'm playing. And when we don't have, when we haven't sort of stopped in reality in the waking life and paused and think, oh, this is what I want to do. These are the actions I need to take. And you're actually doing you're actually living your life um if you're doing that it's like easy to wake up in the morning and be excited and and you don't push snooze you just get out of bed and you don't need to hide away in this little community or whatever that you don't actually like or work in this job that you don't actually like and let that distract yourself but you have something so you you don't you're excited to wake up but when you i feel like when i don't have that and i don't know how universal this is or just specific to me but when I don't really have anything I'm excited about, I just kind of keep pushing snooze, keep going back to sleep, come, keep going back to sleep, fill up my schedule with busy hangouts and meetings to distract myself. And I kind of stay, I'm basically in going back to the original analogy is I'm still like hooked up to that, uh, the matrix, uh, or I'm, I'm dreaming. And that illusion, the feeling of work, of doing something, of action, of living a life is like enough for me. But deep down, I know it's not real. And I think what Robert Nozick's getting at is if we actually knew that it wasn't real, most people would not choose that. Most people would say, no, I don't want to play that game. I want reality. So what counts as real? What what counts as real in, in your book? I don't know. That's that's the thing is like, <laughs> uh, maybe not reality, but um, something we've, Lasting, I think lasting, something lasting, enduring that will last when you're gone is really what we want. Yeah. So I like your analogy, though, that life is a single player game, <laughs> because <laughs> then it gives you the idea that you get to choose the parameters, and that makes it more desirable, and that you're always focusing on the next step. So that makes it more like you have a chance to succeed rather than having this impossible my asthma in the future. So the fact that we all have so much unstructured time now, I think is a very new thing in human history. In the past, before birth control, kids just came as soon as you were in puberty, and it was so damn hard to find enough food 
and water and firewood to keep your kids alive. And then another kid came. So you were so putting out fires all the time that you didn't have that much time left. Like if you did, you'd just find a better way to make a fire and better way to preserve berries for the winter. You didn't have like so much unstructured time, which we have now. So I think that's sort of the newness of the problem. Now, the solution that has been taught to people is, in quotes, save the world. So this is what every young person is taught. And I think, and you know, going back to your philosophy, from as soon as writing was discovered, people wrote about saving the world because it feels so good to imagine yourself rescuing whatever crappy situation you were in when you were young. That's what the adolescent brain wants is I want to be big, I want to be powerful, and I want to fix this situation that I'm in. So that's how we all got wired. And then you don't have any obvious easy way to fix that situation you were in, but your professors give you some theory, some fantasy about if you only do X, Y, and Z, you will save the world. So you go into that because that sort of checks the boxes. So I did that like everybody else. And then after a few of Save the World jobs, I was like, whoa, this this is really not doing anything. This job is just sort of going through the motions and it's fake. So at that point, many people stay in because then they have their pride and their herd bonds are built on that. But because I was so bad at building herd bonds, I think I shopped around for a lot of different herds. Do you feel like you ever found a herd? So um, have I ever found a herd? So so I call it um, a virtual herd. So what I've decided is, and again, I write more on this in each book, we are not animals because we do have this big cortex. So if we wanted to be with a herd every minute, like I could join a cult or I could go to a country where there's a tribe and I have to, let's say, basically my mother-in-law would tell me what to do every minute of every day. That's what many cultures are, you know? And if you're a male, then, you know, some certain relative, they're in charge of you and you must do what the tribe wants and needs every minute of every day. So people don't really like that. If they have a chance to escape, they usually escape. So we have this um, bouncing back ping pong between when I'm isolated, then my inner mammal is looking for a herd. But once I'm with a herd, they get on my nerves because they pee on my grass. So the animal brain really wants to distance itself because it doesn't want to eat grass that's peed on. But once you distance yourself, then you feel threatened by predators. So it's like a seesaw or a, a bungee cord, mm -hmm. and you're always focused on the one you don't have, because that's how the brain works, is it focuses on the unmet need. But if you're always focused on the unmet need, then you're miserable, because then when you have a herd, they get on your nerve, but when you don't have a herd, you feel lonely. So instead, I just said, why don't you just do the opposite is whenever I have a herd, look at the good side of them. And whenever I'm alone to say, oh, thank God I have my space. And just whatever presents itself in that moment, find the positive of that. That's one. Th and then the other answer is... Right, so it's... Oh, can I just... The other answer is... Um, what do you need a herd for? So we don't need it every minute of every day the way our ancestors did. So really, most people are just thinking, oh, what if something happened to me and I needed a ride to the hospital or something like they want a herd just for emergencies. But then what you can't count on people if they can't count on you. So everyone can build whatever reciprocal bonds they think are what meets whatever needs they have. And I'll give you a specific example. Like sometimes something goes wrong in my life and I think, oh, I don't know anybody that I can ask about that. Who do I know that could answer that question? And then I think 
if I ask this person, I know what they're going to tell me and I'm not going to want to take their advice. And then I'm going to feel guilty that they're going to be mad at me for not taking their advice. And then I'm going to think of if I ask this person. And so then I think, wow, I'm really lucky that I get to make this decision myself rather than having her telling me how to make this decision. Okay, now I'll shut up. No, no. I I also have this habit of interrupting. I think it does go back to my, um, it might be a story I'm telling myself. It might actually be a, a, a neural pathway, but I, there's this sort of clamoring for attention uh, for the mother and the father and stuff because there's so many kids and we did have to speak over each other and, and all that. So that's something I maybe need to get over. But I think by doing this podcast, it might slowly, um, the kink might work itself out or maybe it's fine. It's just who I am. But it sounds like we have to accept that we need that we do we need connection, but we also need this um, aloneness, this freedom. And when we try to dichotomize it and say no, life is all about freedom and going on your own path, and or no, life is all about connection. Um, it's a seesaw going between the two of them, and we it, it's not like a, a perfectly balanced place where you know you're, but it's like a almost going from one extreme to the other. Sometimes it's it's different. We you, you go through different parts of the spectrum, and just accept that that's normal. And just deal with it from there. Sounds like that. Okay, so you're writing a new book right now. Can you give us sort of sort of a, a sneak preview on what generally it's going to be about? Don't say too much, but um, yeah, a little little sneak peek. Sure. So I have a feeling that you read. Um, oh, I I wrote and I also orally spoke this. It's called the problem with academic psychology. Did you read that that I did? Because it's uh, your introduction sounded like you read that. I read uh, the political correctness book, so that might have that might have uh, informed me a little bit. Oh, okay. I didn't think I talked about Rousseau in the political correctness. Maybe book. not. Somewhere I talked about. Well, Rousseau, I think you also on, on your podcast on your podcast you talk about a lot, a lot of different things. So I think just it might have just um, seeped through somewhere in your Happy Brain podcast. Well, anyway, or I did somewhere. a podcast episode called. The problem with the problem with academic psychology, and the whole episode was just me talking without a guest. It was the first time I did this, and then I was like, "Yeah, I want to turn that into a book." Oh, yeah, I listened to that. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, because you got the whole Rousseau thing. So that's when I said, "I want to write a book about this." So the name of the book is "Why You're Unhappy: Biology Versus Politics," and it explains how our biology naturally creates unhappiness and it's hard to manage, but we could learn to manage it if we had good information and realistic expectations. But because of politics, we get unrealistic expectations and the disease model of mental health, which sort of gets in the way of learning the skills of managing it. So that's the book. And like I said, on the one hand, I write And then on the other hand, I rewrite, (laughs) but I do think that it will be out soon. And I would love for you to read a pre pre draft. So I will send you a link to that soon. Yeah. And I'll, uh, I don't know if you care about my feedback, but I'm happy to give feedback and all that too. You got your husband doing that for you, but, um, I would love to read that. And great. Thank you for this extra long time today. I expected an hour and I, I was kind of trying to break it off, but also I wanted to keep going because um, I had this chance to talk to you. And I we might be able to do it again. So maybe after you release your book, maybe we could do this again. Who knows? Okay. But um, in the meantime, if people want to learn more about, they want to get your books, they want to get your podcast, take your courses, your certification. You got a lot of stuff. It's all on innermammalinstitute.org, right? So innermammalinstitute.org. And there you can find all the books and all the um, courses and all of that. Uh, you've got even got this, what, five-day, it's for free, this five-day um, kind of thing where you can get all this information and uh, it's free. And even the courses and all these things are very, you, it's like $49 for this course. And at, at, it's worth, I'm not just, you know, blowing air up you or whatever, but I mean, you can, you can easily charge $1,000 for that. I mean, the way it changes people's lives on every level, I think that, I think that's like the best place to start with your stuff because it's like, whoa, and just the value because you're not, you're not trying to get rich off this. You're just trying to spread the word. So I think 
maybe you you might change it down the road and you're like, I want more money. And you could just triple the price or make it 10 times the price. But it's only $49. I think that is... Um, and sometimes there's deals like 10% off or something like that. And that's the place to go. And I guess for a basic overview, the, um, the Happy Chemicals book, what's the new title? I don't. I read the old book. What's the new title? It's an old book. And it's one everyone keeps talking about, but... Yeah. So my core introductory book, it's called Habits of a Happy Brain, Retrain Your Brain to Boost Your Serotonin, Dopamine, Oxytocin, and Endorphin Levels. And it's been, uh, it's published by Simon Schuster and it's been around for quite a while now. So yeah. it's not new, new, but for those fabulous fans who read the original self-published edition, it's still the new book. Now, I also have to mention- But if people want an overview of the chemicals, and that's, that's like a good sort of starting point, that or the course or- That's the best place to start. Unless um, that book has also the science to explain why this works. But some people only want a workbook with the method that's shorter and easier. And I wrote a book a workbook for that. It's called 14 Days to Sustainable Happiness. Yeah. That's easier to read, especially good for um, teenagers and people in recovery. However, um, the course is actually $89, and I was selling it at half price to people on my newsletter in the beginning. Oh. But now um, I'm, but I'm thinking I will create a coupon for people for your listeners. Oh, it's a certification that's $49. The, the, to be a certified trainer, that's $49. The course is $89. Exactly. That's different is I have a certification. Yeah. But like I said, like the values, it's worth over $1,000 probably. So if $89 is a steal because it, it could just, it's all the time, all the time it's going to save you from going, not going down this wrong path in life or the energy, um, just the happiness. What's that worth? And not, I'm not, I know I'm not trying to like sell you, but, uh, that was like I said. I, I've read thousands of, like a couple thousand books. Probably I'm a course junkie. I take all these courses, even the even classes I I took at Berkeley or community college. Um, that course is wow. That was that's one of those life changers. So for anybody, even if you read your books, that course I I loved that course. So thank you for that. And anyway, I can keep going on and on. Basically, uh, if people want to learn more, go to the website innermammalinstitute.org. Um, there you can find the books and kind of. You can start anywhere uh, or start nowhere, but that's the place to go, right? <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, let's keep in touch. And I really appreciate yeah. the great questions. And um, yeah, look forward to your feedback. Yeah, thank you so much, Loretta. I'm ha so happy. Thank you. Bye. Today is your lucky day. Yay. Super special deal. 20% off that course that I'm obsessed with. Train your inner mammal to feel good now. All you got to do is click on the link in the show notes and remember to use the code HAPPY20. Yeah, HAPPY20 because this is the 20th episode. Woo! And to sweeten up this birthday cake, birthday cake, birthday party, even more, I'm going to throw in a free 40-minute hangout session with yours truly, me, where we can talk about everything that you learned from Loretta's course. Just email me at michael at brainshaman.com. And if you don't want to hang out with me, if you're like, uh, no, I'm good. I just want the course, then don't. But take advantage of this super sweet deal, 20% off. All of the information is in the show notes, along with links to a lot of the resources and cool things that we talked about today. Let's keep learning how to optimize our brains and upgrade our lives. Grab a book, grab the course, keep listening to this podcast or even better ones, or suck down a plate of vegetables or soak up some of that free delectable sunshine. Get some Z's, go to sleep. See you soon. Take care.